Hi everybody, welcome to our session where we're running down the Drupal 8 usability testing results. We literally just did this Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this week. So this was a little bit fastly put together, so more news as we have it. Um, I want to thank out to our sponsors, first of all, first and, first and foremost, the University of Minnesota, who uh, hosted our usability testing, got everything set up. So everyone give a hand to Steve up there. <laughs> And then I also want to thank the various companies and the camp itself because they paid for uh, numerous Drupal people to be flown in here so that we could see this in real time and, and, and check it out. Um, I want to do some introductions. Since I'm talking, I'll introduce myself. My name's Angie. I go by WebChick. If you woke up earlier this morning, you probably saw me yak for a while. Um, so I'll do less yakking at this one. I work at Acquia. I make Drupal awesome. And uh, I, uh, this is my third usability testing with Drupal. Uh, so, yeah. Excellent. I think it's my turn. This was my second usability evaluation with Drupal. So uh, I'm Nick Rosencrantz. I'm a user experience analyst at the University of Minnesota. And I want to talk about why the University of Minnesota is involved with this. Uh, the University of Minnesota is a big place. We have a lot of websites. And we are currently uh, transitioning a, a lot of our web products, our web content, into the Drupal platform. And we have a culture in our web development and product development that make user experience, usability, and accessibility a, a priority for the way that we approach it. So it was a good fit. We've invested in Drupal across all of our campuses, not just at the Twin Cities, but you know everywhere. And uh, Drupal site building is critical to our success there. We want to make it as easy as possible for all of the professionals at the university to pick up and go without running into confusion, without running into frustration, or doing something that's not a as efficient as we could make it. So it's a good fit. Uh, I want to talk about the way we approach a usability evaluation. We have a lab space. It's a two-room environment with an evaluator room and an observer room. Uh, what you're seeing up here is the evaluator space. This is where someone, such as Boyan, might sit down and try to do something every day, a commonplace task, while the team observes and takes notes about that experience. What got in people's way, and what did they say about it? That's it for me. Yeah. All right. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm uh, I'm Boyan Somers. Uh, I'm a UX designer from the Netherlands. And I am the maintainer, I guess, of the user experience of Drupal 7 at 8. So to give you a little bit of background of why we actually uh, tested uh, Drupal at this point in time, we wanted to kind of understand, um, I guess, what our assumptions were of how good some things were doing in Drupal 8, um, and to see what the expectations were of users you know, coming into Drupal 8. So we want to kind of validate whether what we did was right. And then we wanted to identify issues that we could kind of still address before release, uh, especially kind of things that are you know, really uh, affecting the user experience. And then, obviously, we would also identify, uh, I guess, bigger issues uh, that could then be addressed kind of after release, uh, for example, in 8.1 or 8.2. Um, I think it's good to know, in terms of the, the people that we uh, tested with this time, um, we had uh, seven participants. Uh, they were all kind of developers, either front-end or back-end developers or site builders. Um, five of them are currently actively using Drupal 7. And they all had experience in various systems. So also like WordPress or Joomla, um, HTML experience, PHP experience. And we spent about one hour and a half testing with them. So these were all people experienced with technology. Uh, they were all web professionals. Um, these were all people that should be able to use Drupal. Um, and um, these people should be able to use Drupal 8 because they also had a background using Drupal. So the scenarios that we gave them um, were kind of common tasks that you would do on your Drupal website. It wasn't anything like super complex, um, but they were like typical site building tasks that you would do. So creating content, you know, adding a link to a menu, placing a block. Um, maybe making a content type, um, all kind of typical tasks. And we gave these tasks kind of as scenarios. And the scenario we gave them is to build uh, a conference website uh, about environmental pre preservation of the Mississippi River, kind of a local team. Um, and we gave them kind of scenarios to carry out these tasks. So kind of not leading in any way. So scenarios that were kind of avoiding the Drupal terminology so that we would kind of try and figure it out themselves. 
I'd like to add something to that. Sure. Uh, if you go back one slide. While this was going on, you know, everyday tasks, they're doing something that Drupal would likely be a candidate for using. I'm facilitating that process with the team. They're sitting behind uh, that glass taking notes while I'm their neutral facilitator. I get to kind of be Drupal's poker face in these moments. Like, I don't have any skin in the game. They can tell me anything. They can say, I love this. Here's why. Or they can say, this is the worst. This is why. And I can just go, OK. Tell me why it seems that way. And that helps the team focus on finding those issues. Yeah, all right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, and, and we also had a help desk uh, in case they really got stuck and they felt like they needed help. Uh, we always had someone there on the other side, actually, of the, of the place that they were testing to answer their questions. Um, and we will try to kind of keep it short, but give them a little bit of direction as to where to go. Um, Sadly, we don't have such a help desk right now for everyone. <laughs> um, they thought it was really helpful, but uh, yeah, sadly we don't. Um, so the process that we took after each session is uh, we identified all of the issues that we found uh, and kind of categorized them per feature set. Um, and we inventorized how critical that issue was in terms of the user experience that they had throughout that session. So some things were just kind of small problems that they could kind of overcome very quickly and other problems kind of really stumped their understanding and kept them from uh, learning how Drupal works. So that's what we did, we, we wrecked them. And then uh, on Thursday uh, we actually spent a whole day uh, trying to figure out which ones of these issues are you know, truly, truly the critical things that we should think and look into. Um, and uh, you know, what are the potential solutions that we have to solving these problems? And Angie will talk next about that. Yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what's working well. And there were some things that were working well. Um, mobile, actually, like across the board, everybody who tried, and this was really awesome, this was new. I was here at, or at the University of Minnesota in 2011 for usability testing, and then when we planned it this time, we were like, is there any way we could <coughs> test it on a phone or something? And Nick was like, absolutely no problems. So they have the lab rigged up so that if you use a device, it wires it to the, um, to the, to the camera, we can see exactly what you're doing, and it was amazing. Um, everybody who tried this uh, was able to get this. They were able to do basic content editing tests, they were able to log in, navigate around, didn't hit any problems with mobile. So the, the work that we did in Drupal 8 to focus on mobile was really important and a lot of people were super impressed by this because um, they were like, wow, this, this is not what I expected this to look like, this is great. Um, we added a WYSIWYG editor in core, thanks Nate. Um, and that actually worked really well. Um, and the image embedding worked well. There were some issues that people found with a few things, but um, overall people were able to instantly know this is a WYSIWYG editor, I added an image here, I can accomplish my task this way. Nobody had a problem with this either. So this is a new feature of Drupal 8 that actually functioned really, really great. Um, this is the uh, content preview. This is new in Drupal 8 as well, um, where the preview button actually shows you a preview instead of your content and your admin theme twice, which is much improved. <laughs> Um, everyone was able to navigate this page really well. They were able to know, they were able to understand this is a preview of what I'm seeing. They would go back to the content editing form to save. Everybody uh, was able to deal with this really well. Um, this is something new as of only a few months ago. In the past, when you wanted to create a menu link to a piece of content, you had to copy in the URL, but not the whole URL, just the part of the URL after the first slash. And this was really, really hard to explain to people. In Drupal 8 now, you have a little autocomplete field where if you start typing the title of the piece of content, it will autocomplete for you. And that was huge. This tested very, very poorly in Drupal 7, and nobody who found the autocomplete was, had a problem with it in Drupal 8. So that was really, really great to, to see. Um, let's see. Oh, 7 theme. So in, in 2011, when we did the usability testing for Drupal 7, we found that people were missing a lot of the Drupal admin interface because these tabs that you see were off to the right. And people were not able to see stuff that was on the right-hand side, and so they would miss huge swaths of the admin interface. The Drupal 8 admin theme looks like this. Everything is very nicely designed with a clear visual hierarchy. Things are over on the left. Nobody had a problem navigating around. They had other problems, but they didn't have a problem getting around the interface. And then finally, inline form errors. And this literally went in last week, maybe two weeks ago. Um, this is a really important usability feature because in the past this would just be like a list of things that are wrong and then you'd have to go and find the red fields, which if you can't see the red fields, 
that's a problem. Um, now what we do is we give you links to where the problems are. You click them, you're taken down to the field, and then the uh, error message is right in line with the, with the form elements. Accessibility, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did I not say accessibility? I meant accessibility, but yes. So this was really huge. This brings us to WK AAA compliance, I think. This was like the one big thing we didn't fix in Drupal 7. It's fixed in Drupal 8, and nobody had any problems with this. So that was great to see, too. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, everything went great. Drupal 8 is going to be fantastic. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Wait. Wait. What so are you doing? The presentation's over. What? Right? Yeah. 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 Everybody there aren't any more slides. No. No more oh, slides. We're done. Yep. Yeah, all done. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry, but this <laughs> presentation is not over. Oh. Um, unfortunately, Drupal isn't yet perfect. Uh, <laughs> And we have some things that we have to fix, and I drew the short straw to explain all the things that we have to fix. Um, so I'm Lewis Nyman, I'm a front-end developer, and I'm a designer, which means I do double the work of everyone else. <laughs> I, um, I work for Wonderkrau, um, I live in Switzerland, but I'm actually English, so I have a good evil voice <laughs> for this kind of stuff. So, problem number one, and this has been around for a long time, uh, Drupal just uses weird terminology. There's loads of words that we have in the UI that just don't map with what users expect in their current experiences. Uh, things like node, content types, views, regions, blocks, they have no idea what these mean um, when they enter Drupal's interface. So this is usually the biggest problem that they hit. Um, we had some users who actually didn't know where to go. They didn't know what a content type was. They didn't even know if they should create a content type. Uh, so this came up really often. Um, we also had a help desk, and Link wants to talk a little bit about the help desk because he did such a good job. About that. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm Link Swanson, I work at the University of Minnesota. I've been involved in Drupal for uh, about 10 years. And so when the participants got stuck, uh, they were able to call this helpline. And of course, Drupal doesn't have a helpline, but the purpose of it is to um, get them going so that we can continue to learn from their experience instead of just having them just be stuck. Um, and so the tricky part of it is that you, as, as a Drupal person, I had to like sort of get them to the right page without telling them exactly what they had to do. Now, one of the most common things that they uh, needed help with was terminology. And so um, explaining to several participants that they needed to create what's called a content type or that um, a listing is called a view. Um, and that, so that was kind of the main thing that we did. But just to at any point where people had to call the help desk, and the majority of them did, um, it's basically considered a fail because if they were in, I mean, they might have gone to a forum or something, but a lot of times they might have just thrown Drupal out and gone to something else. And so, uh, but we do the help desk so that they can keep going in their in their uh, study. We can continue to learn from that. So, yeah. yeah. So it was a difficult balance of trying to just give them enough of the nudge. But um, some of the problems that we had. Um, so I want to actually, these are all direct quotes of people from the uh, system. And with using WordPress, you don't have to figure out how to place your block inside your view, inside your region, inside your homepage, <laughs> <laughs> which is true. Um, in field UI, um, people tend to look for a better language. Like they don't tend to look um, for what Drupal calls it. They tend to think about what it's called in a wider community. So in HTML, um, a checkbox is called a checkbox. It's not called like a a different value based on the data storage. Um, and this one is also true. Uh, someone said right at the end when we were talking to them, they felt like if they learn to use Drupal, it's not going to help them build any other kind of website and any other kind of tool. And this is, this is a problem we've had for a long time, that we introduce these rules that only Drupal has. And it doesn't help anyone outside of uh, Drupal. Uh, someone also said that uh, moving around Drupal feels like a, um, a jumbled up hardware store with no wayfinding. So just having aisles and aisles of things, and you have to keep looking through every single aisle um, to find what you're looking for. And this isn't so much a terminology thing, it's kind of an uh, information architecture problem as well, like where they expect to find things. But it's also a big problem. So we have some solutions to ha for how to deal with um, Drupal's terminology. Um, one thing um, that we're talking about is after we release um, Drupal 8, we can do a thorough terminology review and slowly over time try and fix these different concepts and try and match them with what people usually expect. So instead of a view, maybe it'll be called something else. Um, something that we want to do before release is try and find like a, um, 
uh, <laughs> uh, to try and find like uh, some introductory content that we can do um, uh, that kind of introduces people to Drupal. So maybe it would be um, like some content that appears when you install, saying this is what Drupal does. These are the concepts that Drupal uses. Um, and if only there was someone in the community who was good at making videos and introducing and explaining Drupal. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was meant to do. <laughs> Yes, we should also do yes, that. Yes, that's also a good idea. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that came out during the test is that they have to, like, if they have to know where to find the manual, then it's a problem because they just have problems navigating around. So if we had something at the beginning when you install, saying like, oh, click here, like the first thing you do, uh, this will explain the basic concept of Drupal and how to get around, then we're kind of pushing it to them instead of waiting for them to find it. So that would be useful. One of the tasks that we ask them to do is to place um, a block that already exists in the Drupal system on a page. And it's important to note, as Boyan said, we didn't literally tell them to place a block. We said, go and find some, um, what was the block we used? Recent, it's like Sorry, recently it's registered for the conference. Recently registered for the conference and display us on the homepage only. So this is how they, most people went about it. They, they went to their homepage and they thought, how do I add a block to you? And this is a real, like this is an inverse way of how Drupal works. Because Drupal doesn't ask you to go to the home page, it asks you to go to some other page at the back of the system. Find the block you want to add, uh, find the right region, and then you say where you want to add it. But the one users actually work in the opposite way. So they want to go straight to where the home page is and then figure out from there. But once they realized they couldn't do that, they eventually found their way to the block layout UI. Um, so this is a new block layout um, design in Drupal 8. It's been redesigned to accommodate the fact that you can place blocks as many times as you want in, a, in different regions and on different pages. So if you think about the, um, the context module in Drupal 7, the use case for that, Drupal now supports that out of the box. Um, so we had to redesign the UI to just to show the fact that you can have as many of these blocks on the right hand side as you want and you can place them wherever you want. So they no longer exist at the bottom of the page and you just drag them around. But this was actually surprisingly the biggest problem that we found. Because this is how we see the page, but for most of the users, they see it like this. So they don't even notice that this right hand sidebar over here exists, they just don't see it. And we had a lab set up with eye tracking, we could see where they were looking, and no one was looking over there. And we were screaming behind this glass. <laughs> <laughs> just look over, I'm it's just dead. here, right? Um, so it was, it was really, um, it was really tricky because they couldn't accomplish this task at all. Because they couldn't figure out how to add a block to these regions that they could see. Um, they also got confused by the, the big um, blue button that said add custom block. So one person wanted to add a form to the sidebar. They're like, oh, add a block. I'll go add a block there. Um, they, opened this, uh, they opened this page and they started typing form HTML into the, um, into the body text that was there. Which isn't the right way to do things, but they don't know. Um, and another problem that we had is this block configuration form that you see once you add a block. Uh, so you'll notice um, at the top, the, uh, the cache settings uh, filter is like the first thing you see. And this is the first thing the user sees. So they think it's the most important thing on that page and the most relevant thing to them. But it's not, and they have no idea what it does. So they kept clicking on it, inspecting it, being like, hmm, forever, that seems like a long time. <laughs> And actually what they wanted to do is to place it in the left sidebar, which is the most important thing to them, and that's right at the bottom. And so many people missed that select box right at the bottom. So maybe there's a way of fixing that, I don't know. There's an issue. There is an issue for that. I marked it RTBC this morning. Oh yeah? Oh wow, okay. Um, another problem is that when people scrolled around this block layout page, they saw the listing of the regions, and they they kind of, like, some of them they could understand what they meant, like left sidebar, that sounds good. And they were looking at it and they're like, how do I add something to you? Like, I can see the region, but I don't know how to put something in it. Um, and all it says is no blocks in this region. It's not that helpful. Um, so we brainstormed some potential solutions. Um, one of the things we said is we could change the way the, the page just spoke so we don't put it in the sidebar anymore where no one looks. Um, and we can also add links to place blocks in the regions. And then um, after release, we can think of something much broader, more blue sky. <coughs> how would you build like a perfect page if you could uh, for laying out blocks and regions and stuff? 
Um, so here's an example, adding a big obvious button that says place block. They can see it's big and blue. That seems like an easy improvement that we can make. Um, we can also implement a modal window in a similar way we have with the views UI for adding fields. Um, this is easy to filter. Um, you can add like, supplementary information. You can see here that underneath the title, they have like some secondary content, which kind of explains what it does. So it gives a little bit more context when you're looking through this list. Um, and also, it's right in your face. So you're not going to miss it. It's different to the sidebar, which you can miss easily. Something else we could do, which also seems simple, I don't know, um, is to add a link to any empty regions that just says, add a block to this region, which seems kind of helpful. Um, and it would be nice It would be nice if Drupal was helpful. We probably want to do that even for the regions that already have a block. Yeah, we could do it still, like for regions that have blocks. It and makes perfect sense. Links. <coughs> oh, yeah, we also don't think we have a slide for that. But yeah, we're also talking about adding a contextual link to every region. And uh, you, know, you click on it, and it says, add a block to this region. So they don't oh, even so have to go. <laughs> yeah, so they wouldn't even have to go into the, the back end to find the region in another place. And they can already see it on the page they're on. Right, so the other task we asked them to do is to create a content type with fields. But that's not how we worded it to them. That's not how we worded it to them, that's right. Um, we asked them to allow for presenters to be able to submit session proposals for this website. And we tried to lead them with the wording of what we did without just telling them what to do. So we told them that you want to set up the pages in a rigid way that's not completely flexible, um, so people can put the right information in the right area. So the first problem that users had, the first thing they did, is which field type do I choose for all these different, um, all the different information attached to this session content type? Um, and this is again like they had the same problem that came up in other areas. They had this mental model of uh, they thought about the front of the website and what people will see, and then like after that they wanted to think about how the data was structured, which is the opposite to what Drupal does. One participant in particular actually <coughs> started before they did anything. They pulled out their piece of paper and started sketching what they wanted the user interface to look yeah, like that's right. for the users who were submitting. And they, they, and they were saying, like, I want a text box here, I want a radio button here, I want some check boxes here. Um, but the first thing they see with Dribbble is a page like this, which just says like the, the machine name and the label and the type of fields. And they're like, where do I find radio? Where do I find check box? These are things that I understand. Um, <laughs> I love this cool. Yes, it speaks for itself. Um, but so much of Drupal is like this. It's like, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a form. In order to create a form, you have to create a content type. Then you need to add your data model to your content type. Then you need to select the widget for the content type. And then finally, you can add a piece of content on a form somewhere. So you start way back here in order to think. So it is basically like if you want to make an apple pie, you start by creating the universe. Then you probably make apple trees. And then you does it, does it, does And so a lot of Drupal is like this, and it, it really messes with yeah. Um, one other problem that we had is the listing we have for field types is really confusing. Um, most users spend a long amount of time looking through this page, trying to figure out um, which field type they should choose. And it doesn't help that um, the most common one, which is text, is right at the bottom. And there's about six different types of text here. Text plain long, text formatted long with summary, list text, text formatted, text formatted long. No one really knew what all these meant and they couldn't figure out like, what effect this decision has until they click on it and then go through to that field type settings. And eventually they get to see what this widget looks like and they're like, oh, that's not what I wanted. Delete, start again, choose another one. Another one of the problems is that um, the, the field types that are at the top are just the general ones and I think the reason they're like that is because the groups are alphabetically sorted. Um, so it's just the default way that they um, show up. But the first one on the list is Boolean. <laughs> and someone actually Googled what Boolean was during the test. Because <laughs> they were like, this seems important. I should know this. But they really shouldn't have to know this, right? Uh, we don't expect people to know. Uh, we shouldn't expect them to know what Boolean means. Um, one of the other issues that we've introduced during um, Drupal 8 is that we've added entity reference uh, during Drupal 8. Um, and that's in the back end, I guess it's been used to replace the term references that we had. No references, it's all unified under one type of field. But to keep the consistency, what we did is um, keep the labels that say uh, taxonomy term, but really what we were doing is adding an entity reference again that has like 
it pre-fills out the type of entity you want to reference. So when I click, when I select entity term for adding a new field, um, it's just creating an entity reference field and pre-selecting that I want it to reference the entity term. So it's like a small level of, of abstraction to maintain the same names we had before. But this is really confusing for users because the next page they go to, it asks them what type of item they want to reference, and they think they have to fill it out again, even though they've just chosen it. There's so, an issue for that. Is that? Great. Less work for us to do. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, it was a follow-up to the one that did that, that, that eliminated the individual types of references. Yeah. It was a follow-up issue. Just never got Can through. you tag it UMN twenty fifteen? I have no idea where it is. Okay. <laughs> we'll find it. find it. Yeah, we'll find it. Um, but this kept causing problems later on because when they went back to their field listing page, there was um, their their field type was listed under entity reference, and they never, as far as they knew, they never created an entity reference type field. So they were like, where does this come from? What does entity reference mean? I've never seen this before. So having this very thin abstraction that then just disappears again really confuses you know, most of the users that we saw. Um, it also caused a really funny error when someone tried to add a taxonomy term called Asian carp, and it said, there are no entities matching Asian carp. <laughs> So, some potential solutions for all those problems that are related to the field UI is to actually explain which widgets are available for each type of field. So if you choose um, text long, then it says like, you know, the kind of widgets you're gonna expect. So bridges that gap, um, brings the widgets and the data types closer together to bridge that understanding. Um, and also changing the order, so we're leading with the, the more um, useful and commonly used ones, seems like an easy fix as well. Um, but after release, when we have more time, and we can kind of uh, reinvent the design a little bit more. We want to add um, live preview, so when people select and go through the settings, they can see the widget that's being made. Um, and we can also add, like um, again, like a view style select thing, so um, you can filter through them, and it can show you more information at the same time. Link had a really good idea for how to do previews on like the manage fields and manage display. Uh, pages, not to put you on the spot. Yeah, um, so views, when you're building views, it kicks a preview at you like, while you're doing things and adding stuff, and that's really helpful to see what's happening as you're doing config. Um, so <clears throat> one of the ideas, again, we're doing blue sky stuff here, but is that as you're making, if you're building, or putting fields on something or doing some of these major configuration tasks or common configuration tasks, as you're choosing things, kick back that live HTML preview both for how the form is going to look to your content creators and for maybe even lorem ipsum it for how the content is going to look on the front end of your site. And uh, that probably would have solved a lot of the, it takes a lot of the mystery out of like, what am I choosing here? I'm choosing list text, what's that going to give me? I'm choosing this and it, it sort of helps a lot for that. So People relied on previews heavily. Whenever they saw them they were like, oh this is great to the point where like they actually like, in the field UI, when you create, you know, say a list text and you configure how many options, the next page has a default value that shows the widget you just created and all of them were like, oh, that's what it's gonna look like. They were really happy that they saw a preview and that's not a preview. It's it is a value to enter a default value, but they, they sought that everywhere. They wanted to see what it was gonna look like before they created it. Yet how many of us have used that as a preview when we are like configuring mm -hmm. our field and we see the default value, like, oh wait, no, that's not what I wanted. Now I wanted radio buttons or something. I forgot to check this. And so that's, people relied on that already as a preview. Yeah, there's loads of great um, UI features in views, um, which will be great to have all over a call, but it's just like pulling it out of views and making it reusable. That's the big, that's the big challenge. But another um, blue sky solution in the future would be just rebuilding um, the form um, interface, so content types and fields, so uh, it kind of just like shows all these things straight away for you. Um, and that is super blue sky, the bluest of skies. <laughs> Um, one other problem that actually came up, uh, which we weren't expecting at all, was that the home page is not distinctive. So these... Um, Quick, which one is which? Yeah, yes. Which, which is Someone tell me which one is which. Which one's the node? Which one is... Right, right, right. Right, which one's the node and which one's the home page? Home page is what? Right. right. You got to read more. Read more. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. there's like a really... There clues, but only because... Right. Yeah. It's, it's really, really small. Yeah. It's like, where's Waldo style clues where you have to find that tab in the corner? Exactly. You so. can eventually, it's like one of those, like, you know, in Highlights Magazine, it was like, find the differences. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like that. Um, so several participants said, where's my homepage? And then others said, where did my content just go? Yeah, they were really scared that they checked an option that made the page they just created into the homepage because they came here and they're like, oh, this is, is this, is this my homepage? Like they couldn't tell. So it was actually a really big problem like that is like caused by a really shallow um, uh, styling problem. Um, one of the, oh, okay, so one of the other problems with this is that we designed the default Drupal homepage like it's the 90s. So you just have like a list of your recent articles and nothing else. Whereas every website now actually has a strategy of marketing about how to, you know, sell the thing that they're producing. Um, so one of the solutions that we have is to make the homepage more distinct, but also kind of overhaul the design so it matches like what a homepage would look like. Um, and a good example of that is Squarespace. When you, do, uh, when you install it out of the box, it looks like this, and it gives you loads of default pages and default content, and you can just edit it. Um, and it gives you like a, an easy jumping off point, and um, it shows you how your site could actually work using examples. I think I'm next, Ivan. right? Sorry. I'm Ivan Stegich. I'm uh, with 107, and we're a local Drupal agency in Minneapolis. So, um, where to next? Well, we, we can certainly fix it, right? Um, and we're going to try to do that right away. So, we have sprints tomorrow at the nerdery. There are um, cars that are leaving here in the morning to get you out to Bloomington to the nerdery. And there's, I think, still a list out on the front desk where you can write down your name uh, if you need a ride. Um, there's free breakfast and free lunch there, so you, you won't be hungry if you go. And uh, the, the first link on the screen is a link to the meta issue. So this is the issue that kind of outlines the whole, basically the whole week and everything we did at a very high level. Um, and then I think there are links to the actual uh, listing of issues with the tag UMN2015. Um, and then tomorrow at the Notary, we'll also have the inaugural sprint for the user manual that Joe and Jennifer will be leading. Um, so if you know how to read and write and, cop cut and copy and paste anything on a computer, you should be attending that if, if you can. Um, and then we also have other sprints that are happening um, in the coming months. Um, there's Drupal Camp North in England in July, there's Drupal GovCon in uh, Bethesda in July as well, and then of course there's Barcelona where there'll be a whole bunch of sprinting as well. Um, but what we really want to do as well, in addition to the sprinting to fix the current problems, is to do even more testing. Um, so we'd like to be here again next year to do additional testing um, in the lab, if you'll have us back. Um, we have lots of data on problems that are just in core, but we'd like to expand that so that we're including Contrib as well. And so that we're also testing a more fully featured version of Drupal. So by that time, we'll have Drupal 8 something out, I think. Um, <laughs> So more testing, and that, that would be a good thing. And I think that's a good thing to do because um, like the intent is definitely not to have core be as bare bones as it is today. Like Drupal 8, the difference between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, we move tons of stuff into core. Views, entity reference date, you know, all of these things that are sort of fundamental site building you know, pieces, um, WYSIWYG, et cetera. We want to keep doing that in the Drupal 8 cycle. Like we want to keep making sure that Drupal 8 has everything you need out of the box. So, you know, path auto, media, all of these kinds of things, panels, those should be targets that we can look at in subsequent versions of 8.0. So it's somewhat of a misnomer to keep testing just core because we hope that with each subsequent version of 8, Drupal will become better and better and more capable and not be as bearable as it is today. So now we have a good baseline to do that from. Yep. So an extra special thanks to Steve, Gwen, and also to Nick. Um, you guys have been awesome. The facilitation was great. You guys are professional, enthusiastic, really enthusiastic, neutral when it needs to be in the, in the lab. Um, and it's been a great, great experience, a wonderful local resource, and not just for us, but also for the entire community globally. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Um,
Thank you, plus, plus, yeah. plus. So. And I want to thank the Drupal community for this because, yeah, this was a project and we did it, but one of the things that makes this a great experience for myself working with you is to see a community that's this dedicated to doing things right for the end user. By keeping them in mind and having creative ways of solving their issues, it keeps my head in the game and allows me to keep doing this kind of work with you. So thank you so much for keeping them in mind. They appreciate it. Thank you. And um, we'll see you tomorrow at the sprints. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Great Q and A. Any Q and A? Suggestions. I have a question. So, one of the things that you mentioned is that users are coming in with a certain set of assumptions that are backwards from the way it was designed to work. And I know that's not a new observation. <laughs> and the perennial question around that that I keep asking is, so to what extent do we change Drupal? And to what extent do we provide better guidance for the user to develop that other mental model? Because the, yeah. things are there where they are in Drupal for very good reasons. If you're a professional content strategist, which most people aren't. So why there, don't we balance those Yeah, there's a couple layers to that question. So, um, you know, what? What the real mental model is that most people come in with is a page is something from the top left corner of the browser to the bottom right corner. I think I'm doing that correctly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and that is that that's logical. When you go to a page, a web page, that is what you see. Um, we're never going to break people out of that mental model, and that is also not how we want Drupal to work. Um, the way that Drupal works where it is little bits of content that you could mix and match in various views or throw them in a mobile app or whatever, that's one of Drupal's core strengths. So we never want to be a uh, Dreamweaver. Like we're, we, that is not a goal that we have in mind to evolve you know, Drupal back to the 90s to become this you know, static page generation thing. Sure. Um, contemplate module. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, <laughs> but, the, the, but the idea is we could do a lot more to not... Like, it, we, we do work backwards, but we don't have to expose that complexity to people. No. So in-place editing is a good example. Um, and unfortunately, nobody found it. <laughs> Oops, so we have to fix that. But, but the idea behind in-place editing is you go to where you logically think of the content of your site, which is the front end, and you say, I see a typo here, and I just edit right in my front end. And I hit save, and I'm done. I don't have to break out of my current place where I am and think about where would Drupal have put this and then go and find the thing. And I mean, the edit tab that we've had since Drupal whatever, one, that is an example of this, you know, because in a lot of systems, you actually have to go into a completely different system, right. use something like the content administration page to find the piece of content and then click on it and then edit it and then do a deployment process, the whole thing. And we fixed that for content very early on when you can click edit. I remember one time I worked on a site, I think it was for MTV or something, and we had done so much work to customize it and make it awesome, and then we were demoing it to their content authors, and they couldn't get over, like, I could just click edit on the page, wow! And I was like, it's like yeah, that's built in, but look at this, up. They're like, wow! You know, so don't <laughs> the value of I like, yeah, exactly. It's like people want to do that. So we got to stop making people do the clunky, weird thing for all of the other things that are not content. So we got to fix it for blocks. We got to fix it for menus. We got to fix it for anything that's on the front end of your site. You should be able to edit from the front end of your site. And, it, and a lot of these are very simple. To, like we've got a lot more infrastructure now than we did in Drupal 7. The quick edit thing, once people can find it, that could become a panelizer swooshy thing. You know, and you have the plus button in your region, you can add a block there. Or you go to menu, you click the drop down, you say add a link here. But more of that. So we can keep the architectural blocks cleanly and nicely separated because we need that. But don't force that architectural separation on you know, people who are just trying to get a free and web page built. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think one thing, too, to your question about um, teaching people that they first need to create this and then they need to create this, um, you can remedy that by having these helper links all over the place where it's like, they're looking for it here. Oh, do you need to add uh, something Mark. first? Link to that thing and then destination them back to where they were. And then or if they just create something, so you just created a block. Do you now need to place your block or you just your view just generated a block? You can find it over here. I know that we already do that. but. More of those things where you create a thing and it tells you now what to do with the thing, or you look in one place to create it and it gives you a thing that's not here yet because you didn't make it. Here's where you go. Just more of those sort of points 
um, self-teaching system. Yeah, where right. you don't have to teach them, oh, first you need a abstract concept. It's like you can just bring them there. I see you. So, you know, I think all of that is wonderful. Like, you know, you should be able to look at your menu and be able to add a link there and, and be kind of hovering over a region and add a block there. I think that is an excellent idea. But I'm not sure how that would fit into the, the you know, data modeling that goes into the content types. Because that is something that you need to have some kind of data architecture ideas or, you know, how, how to separate your site into the different content types and add the fields to them and stuff. I'm not saying it can't be improved with the ideas you talked about here, which is great, but I don't think that that's something that you're going to find in the front end. Well, the, the like biggest thing we can do there is call them content forms or something yeah. and build it from the form and then do the data model as an afterthought. And I get that that's really challenging because that's not how Drupal works, but the more we can model it around what the user's going to see at the end of it, the better off we're going to be. And there was a patch floating around, I think Nate worked on it and Swentel worked on it, where we were using the form builder module as the UI to create CCK yeah. fields. I'm not saying it can't be approved, I'm just saying that yeah. that's not an example of something that I'm going to find on the front end of my site. And, and but you will, it's a form. And it's, and, it's a, and it's a page display, right? Well, it's like, like if you go to add content, you can say make a new form. Or something like yeah. that, yeah. yeah. But no, it's not, and it's not well, even just about that, it's, it's about... Like a region to put a block in. There's not something where you're going to have a oh, I see. Yeah. Like for that. Yeah, I mean, you could do it from the content, like go to add content, and there's an add a new one of these here. Yeah. But moreover, that, the problem with that is you're adding this totally abstract concept called a content type, which means nothing to anyone, except apparently Adobe users, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then you add this totally abstract like data modeling thing where like a user doesn't know, uh, like if someone's thinking in, a, in terms of a form, they don't know that a checkbox is a boolean. I don't know what you're saying about yeah. the form stuff. I, I, right, I'm right, right. Yeah, I'm just saying that, that getting to that idea of adding a form or a type or whatever we're calling yeah. it that's not something that's either region or a contextual link. Correct. So. No, yeah. It's, it's yeah. The, so the, the entry point would be a context of you're creating a form here. In fact, you have your article page form. Yeah. So like if you're on the node add page, whatever For it is, example, yeah. yeah. And it says, oh, uh, add a new one of these things. Or even add fields to your form. Like you're on your article page and it's like, would you like to add a tags field to this or something? You know, yeah. you can add yeah. fields so to the existing. But yeah, we, we talked about that. We have something new in Drupal 8 is what's called the tour oh, module, yeah. and it lets you do that. It lets you have a little pop up that's like, you're in the footprint, and you click next, and then it highlights this section, and then it goes over here. So we have the infrastructure for that. The tricky part is like Starting getting people it. to see it and deciding what to put in it and this kind of thing. But if that's something you'd be passionate about working on tomorrow, that would be amazing. Well, I can't I think people will It'll be so rocket. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll uh, yeah, that would be great. Yes. People like me can't write that. I think that leads a lot of attention. It does. It does. We, we, have a, we have a big issue of trying to decide. We have this tour module, and we have one or two tours in the form, but we have a big, we postponed making more until somebody could decide what we needed, and that, that piece is still missing. Right. No one has articulated what the tours are, and hopefully, maybe some of this stuff might like, help. Sure, especially to put it in the user's language. Yes. Because we need to speak their language. Uh, I, there are lots of questions I want to mention. I'm going to stick around after this session is complete. I'm not going to something else. So if you have questions for me about, like, how did we do this, I'll be available for you. Question. I was going to ask, if, if we're talking about putting default content into every Drupal installation, um, that that would be a great thing to, to build a tour off of. 
yeah. um, but also a great opportunity to use that default content to explain what they just installed yep. and how to get around maybe <laughs> that's the of like where, where they can go next if they're going to just yeah. Instead of sure. just using lorem ipsum, it would be a it would be help actual content. documentation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Like, Hello, we're the we're the we're doing the project, want to but it. also a community. Here's how you can start mm -hmm. your journey down the rabbit hole to find more information. Yeah. Yep. Content is hard. I, I like your idea, but I'm just going to warn you: writing good content is a rough go. <laughs> The nice thing though is we only have to get it right for the default install and we can change it at any time because we can always make the default install better. But yeah, it's very true. Don't underestimate how much work that's going to be, especially in a community of 3,000 developers. I saw your hand first. Yeah, um, just, I, I have a question I want to add on to that a bit. Like, it might be possible during installation to have just a, almost like a short survey, and you can opt out of it, but just to say what type of thing you want your site to have. Mm -hmm. And then that would sort of maybe yeah. have a couple of different options for this pre-configured content. It'd be a big project to put together, but that would probably help a lot of different types of users. Mm -hmm. It's called Snowman. <laughs> yeah, we, we tried to do it, but he's saying something slightly different, which is get real-time feedback from users in a way that we can improve the product incrementally. Correct? Totally. Well, yeah. and then, and then one you saying when they're doing the install at first? Like yeah, so we do it for two purposes. You, you, as you're installing a new Drupal site, it's the first time you've done it, maybe you, last time you did it was a while ago. If the software asks you a couple questions, yeah. takes the form of a survey, say what type of things do you want, and maybe six or seven questions, not too demanding, then it would pre populate your site. Mm -hmm. So it would yeah. serve a bunch of different types of users, but then also you could add analytics to that, so that can go back to the Drupal organization. Yeah. I'm getting the sense that a lot of you are coming up with ideas, and those are awesome. Get a piece of paper right now, or grab your phone, write those things down, because we have a place for them to live. We yeah. identified a lot of issues, and we came up with some suggestions ourselves, but yours are great too, and they should be attached to the issues that are out there in the queue right now. So write them down, get them out of your head before you lose them, so yes. that we can start pushing on them a little bit. So I did have a question too, uh, about the change all the words initiative. Um, one of the things I think a lot of us notice is so now we have appearance and extend mm -hmm. instead of themes and modules. And, and I don't, I'm sure there's data on this, but to me, themes and appearance are just as good as each other, and modules and extends are both completely obtuse, and, which is fine. I'm sure that's a problem. But so what? What methods are in the cards to make that initiative work? Can you like, show how that do we do that? Right? Stuff? Can can we change? Change? Yeah, I can. Oh yeah. You want me? To what? Not right now? No, wasn't there one called the Nile project? Yeah, the Nile project. Uh, yeah, there's two familiar to some of you, so uh, to some of you, so uh, chime along. Here's a browser. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> noun Careful, project dot yeah, something yeah. com. Is this yeah, a thing? Right. Yeah. What is this keyboard? All right. <laughs> <laughs> English. This is the noun project. You can type in any word and find out what people have said it might look like. So, for instance, if I type in appearance, <laughs> why do you move the return? Okay. So here's what appearance could look oh, like. Rabbit. These are items that people have said that might look like. If I type in entity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> So this is one way to do that, but another thing we talked about is a terminology review. Mm. Let's suppose that I put on a note card in front of you. I say, this is where you place things you want to show to users. Flip this note card around and tell me what you would call that. You might call it one thing, you might call it another thing, and if you do that for about 40 people, you'll get a lot of ideas back as to what most people are calling that. One thing we wanted to be careful with is that uh, the terminology of Drupal is one of its strengths in the development side and some of the, the, the Swiss Army knife and the very, the fact that the terminology is very abstract, an entity, that could be a dog or a cat or a corporation or whatever, and in Drupal it kind of is anything, but it's sort of, right? And That's so the there strength. are a lot of these like very like, abstract terminology, that's part of the strength of Drupal from the architecture standpoint, but not from the learn how to use it and, and use it effectively standpoint. So it's like, um, and I'm reminded of studying in philosophy of language, very like a two subject, and I see Drupal words in there that they're using. I'm like, oh, okay, well, all right, that's actually helped. But we don't want that for end users or for beginners, but of 
we also don't want to throw it away and replace it with page and other things like that. So You could just replace it all with the Latin language to really yeah. nail the accuracy. <laughs> as long as you pick up Latin, you've got this. Right. Uh, but I mean, so that's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged thing where it's like, that's the strength, but that's also why there's such a steep learning curve. Well, that's kind of my question is, where's the balance between yeah. easy to learn and then easy to use? Yeah. It also don't always be precise. precise. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> a little inaccuracy saves a ton of explanation. It does. Yeah. Okay. That's the problem. If you choose, if you choose to use a vague term like page, it, it can mean a lot of different things. We have that problem. That's one of the rules in the spreadsheet. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we, we're gonna. This is why it's a Drupal nine thing. We don't have to worry about it. But you know, one of the things that you showed was that optimal workshop thing with the click paths. Yeah, I um, can't pull that up right now. But okay. Yeah. Anyway, he showed this awesome tool. I have a whiteboard, but I have no whiteboard model. Oh, are so, you talking about the tree <laughs> graph? And then, you know. Tree yeah. jack, you can show that. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know if I have the. That's uh, fine. But the idea was you ask people a question like, how would you. Oh, is that a whiteboard marker? Two. Okay, can we do this? Oh! Hey, okay, we're having fun. <laughs> I had it and then I dropped it and then I found one when I was bent over. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> You know, so Launch the demo. This was a click path, so this isn't quite the same thing. But the, the when results. I saw this, my mind went, yeah. So they had like this task, which was like from the university Beep homepage, boop. how would you find out about benefits for your students? Here. Um, like as a parent, how, if your student is covered under your medical plan or not. And everybody got this click path, which was medical. Oh, did you get it? Yeah, I mean, I did. Oh, then sh I'll shut up. And you can OK, so I want to show you what a tree test is. It's kind of like the opposite of a card sort, which might be familiar to you. But let's suppose that you came up with a navigational structure around all of Drupal's abilities and features and you wanted to put that in front of someone. You give them one of those tasks that you had before, say you want to add a thing to the homepage that shows you who has registered recently. You could test that with your existing Drupal navigation and you could find out how successful that is to people given the navigation you present. So I will show you what's called a pie tree. This thing's magic. It's so cool. It's so cool. So here's the navigation structure that you presented to the user where they started from the home page and then they started working through your supposed navigation to see where they got tripped up, where they thought things would be, and where they actually arrived at. So you could hopefully figure out where those uh, breakdowns in understanding may have occurred. Oh, everyone was looking for block, but they found entity. Am I using those words right? I have no idea. In the middle of the test, I pulled up a YouTube video by CGP Gray about how the Netherlands is organized. Yes. It's about, yeah, three minutes long. And it explained more about the complex, ridiculous structure of the Netherlands than I ever thought could be possible in three minutes. And I related that to the way Drupal is architected. You know, these things are here, and here's why, and here's some history that explains that, because here's how websites work. And also, there's these exceptions. But it does it in a way that is absorbable and eh, kind of makes sense, even though it's complex. Can we hire him to do a three minute video on Drupal? We have to yes. yes. yeah. 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 D8 accelerate. No. <laughs> Back to you. Yeah. No, that was great. I just wanted to, because like, a lot of people in this room, I think, are like me, had never seen that stuff before. So, yeah. That's cool. Can you do a money tree too? A money tree? Yeah. I would love a money tree. <laughs> that would solve so many Jacob, you had your hand up at the beginning and then you put it down and now it's up again? Yes, I can do keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Go. Uh, I, I was actually kind of curious, uh, even though I've been following these for years, I don't know the answer to this and I feel embarrassed that I should. Where does this data go afterwards? Does it go yes. to a class, to other open source projects? I have some good news with regards to the whole Drupal community. The methodology that I take to do this is not secret. If you have questions about how we did this, and if you want to do this yourself, I can give you like our scripts. The scenarios that we did are public. The project plan is public. This spreadsheet is up on Google. Anyone can view this. And a lot of this is going to get pushed under Drupal.org. We'll and have the videos. We'll have clips of the videos. Just they're not the most week. boring videos you've ever seen. Let me ask it a different way. Are we as a community giving back to something else? Because we are getting a lot of information from Google.org and things like that, but are we giving In back a way, to like you talked about like the the way the way in which we so we were pretty demanding. Um, we were like, That's look, we have a very <laughs> distributed community and there's only four people who can be in this room, but there needs to be four thousand people who see this. 
And so we were like, can we please get release forms that let us publish the videos publicly? And by the way, can we WebEx them and live stream them at the same time? And can we do this, this, this? And Steve was the man and totally made that happen. But the good news is because we were kind of demanding and annoying and that kind of thing, um, now Moodle is going to be using the lab later on this year and they'll be able to benefit from all of that process. There's a learning management tool called Moodle that allows uh, the university to put courses up. And we're going to be conducting a usability evaluation of that in August when Moodle Moot, whatever that is, some <laughs> United States meeting gathering of Moodlers for something. And we're going to do the same thing with their community. We're going to do some usability evaluations and get those issues out to their community based on what we learned how to do that with this community. What, was your question also like how does the university benefit from, from how it do you get back? That, yeah, it was partially that. So, so, so one thing is that... Also it was, is what, I guess what I'm really getting at is like this seems to be a good cycle here. You know, there are other products that use similar terms to Drupal and other products that are similar to, to Drupal that don't use the terminology at all. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know which one's right, I don't know which one's wrong. We all have things. But there are things that we, we learn. And simply we're doing it passively. So this is a good example. Like Moodle does it and they go, hey, Moodle, we found these things work really well. Oh, like a like, meta layer where we, we all learn share. Moodle, Moodle no. learns from us, we learn from Adobe, Adobe learns from us, we learn from Site. Would you like to set something like that up? I would love that. <laughs> a gathering of the open source community. No, but I would love that to exist. <laughs> Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> but seriously, I would, I would love for something like that to exist. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be amazing. One of the things that you all can take out of this is an understanding that if the user can't use it, it doesn't work. And if you can take that message and share it with the people that you work with and build that sense of empathy for where they're starting from and their expectations and how those are, are understandable. They're not wrong to feel those ways, to believe those ways, and we need to help them where they are. Are you sure that these are just not wrong? <laughs> I'll go test and find out. <laughs> Anything else? No, I think we're good. Or, Larry, did you have one more thing? Or? So this is kind of more of uh, a Drupal strategic question. On uh, the improvements to the block app, um, wow, they can't seem to find the, the sidebar. That shocks me, too. Um, <laughs> we should fix that. But how much work do we want to put into that before we just change the approach? Because there's been talk of somewhere in the D8 cycle pulling in layouts from the Scotch initiative. That, so, that yeah. particular issue, I believe, is critical, and we have got to fix it before yeah. release. That yeah. is a primary interaction of a primary site building UI. And all of these things, this is actually a great slide to have up right now, except that the columns are kind of obstructing. Yeah, 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 but basically, for each one of these issues, we had a pre-RC column and a post-RC column. And so the pre-RC column is, I think, 90% of these will be novice issues. It'll be like, add a link here on this page that goes over there. Or, you know, do, a, like, add a link in the region to say place a block here, this kind of stuff. Yeah, and I, I'm totally with you on, you yeah. know, add this link here, add this link here, move this from the left to the right. Yeah. Totally do that right now and be done with it. Yeah. Um, for some of the larger discussions around how to revamp that, how do we tie that into the other discussions around changing what that model is in the first place? Yes. Which... I think most people are still on board with doing, just not before you point out. Yeah. Um, so and the, the question, the answer to that is like, we don't know exactly. Like, basically, I, I've split this into two, or we have all split this into two. The simple things we're going to try and do as many of those before eight as possible, and none of them are going to be big. Like, how do, should we really envision this? But then, with this data, this will help us inform. So, if we do want to move Panelizer into core in 8.3, we understand like like this is going to trip people up, this is what they're expecting, and we can you know make it so if it does go in core, it matches the expectations we have here. So this this data isn't going away. All of this data will be public, it'll all be linked off that meta issue, it'll also be linked under the Drupal.org slash usability hyphen tests or testing URL or something like that. So mm -hmm. um, so what we will do is basically reference back to this every day for the next four years. Can I say something about Scotch quick? So, um, what's going on in C tools right now? Uh, there's going to be something to revamp the blocks page because it kind of doesn't jive with what we need for panels. And Scotch still exists; it's not dead. We have meetings every Tuesday at uh, noon Central Time on IRC in the Scotch Drupal Scotch channel. So, come check that. Nice. Well, uh, maybe a good final point would be: Where are we at for tomorrow? What 
Like, what are we ready yes. to work on tomorrow? So tomorrow, what we need mostly, and I said this this morning, we need people who can copy and paste. <laughs> because we, we have this great spreadsheet of things, and we use the spreadsheet because it's fast, and we can move quickly. We need all of this in the issue queue. And I've started moving some stuff in the issue queue. And how we did this in 2011 is we had a table, and then we broke out the spreadsheet by this row, this row, this row, and then everyone just went mad and entered data. There are a couple of things in this list as well that are actionable. And so if there are people who are like, I got copying and pasting makes me want to shoot myself in the face, but I would be happy to add links to places, we could have an implementation team as well working on some of those things. But at the end of the day, I want to make sure all that stuff we found ends up in the issue queue, because if it doesn't, we're going to lose it. And that would be very sad. So if we don't end up doing that tomorrow, I will work on it myself the next two weeks, and I'm sure I could pull in other people to help with that. But everybody can make a difference. Yeah, yeah, really. Like Even if you only have 15 minutes, come over, make three issues, that would be great. We have something like 150 rows in the spreadsheet. Probably 30 of them are in the issue queue. So we've got a lot of work, but it's really easy. You know, If, if everyone in this room came over, copy and pasted five rows, we'd be done. So. Sure. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, that's great.